where will you find resilience? Redeploy. Four years ago, uh, let, let me explain that. So I was uh, sitting in an incident review, and I asked a question. I asked, uh, someone had been describing a sacrifice decision that was made, some load shedding or some other thing. I don't actually remember much else about the incident review meeting, but I'll remember what the facilitator said to me for the rest of my life. Because what he said to me was, uh, we don't ask who questions here because we're blameless. Uh, raise your hand if you've been in a blameless post-mortem or incident review or other such thing. Raise your hand if you're in an organization that values blamelessness in some way. Most of you. Cool. So before I go any further, I need uh, to make some caveats here and sort of give the operational range for the advice contained in this talk, which is this talk is for uh, practitioners. Uh, this talk is for the people in the room doing the work. Are, are the bosses all gone? Cool. So let's talk about how we can get better at doing postmortems. Uh, I'm going to make a maybe charged claim, uh, which is that blameless postmortems are making us less resilient. Um, so I want to convince you that this isn't about the idea of blameless postmortems. I think John Oswald's essay was quite good. But I think that blameless postmortems, as they are being practiced, um, are not letting us tap into some of the sources of resilience that we need. And so the goal of this talk for me is to give you an understanding of how blame works so that you can understand how it works in this context, and to give you some concrete ideas about how you can participate or facilitate these meetings differently. So I'm going to start by talking about what I think is one of the fundamental reasons that blameless postmortems aren't working as well as we would like, and I'm going to call it the fundamental attribution error, just to confuse you, and it's the idea that attribution has a causal connection with blame. Specifically, that if you know who did something, then you will blame them. Uh, one of the problems with talking about blameless is that no one seems to have bothered to define what blame is, and so I want to be a little bit more specific here and say that attribution can lead to sanction. Punishment. So uh, John Alspaugh's essay talks about punishment and retribution. So those are examples of sanction. <laughs> and so the idea here that I've seen uh, that's represented in we don't ask two questions here is if we want to not sanction in ways that are destructive, and I think we all agree that, that punishment and retribution can be destructive, we want to stop that. The idea that I sometimes see is that the way that we do it is by stopping attribution. Um, I've even seen this in Pedro Duty's Incident Postmortem Guide, where they said that a blameless postmortem is critical for understanding failures because we want to understand how the mistake was made instead of who made the mistake. And I have some bad news for people who want to understand how mistakes were made <laughs> without knowing who made the mistakes. So let me, let me use this example. Uh, so let's say that you notice that planes are crashing, and you think this is bad, and you want to stop the planes from crashing. And so you notice the causal relationship between planes taking off and planes crashing, you think to yourself, I get it, what we do is we make the planes stop taking off. <laughs> and this prevents the problem. If there are no planes taking off, there are no planes crashing. The problem is that while attribution can lead to sanction, it's also necessary for learning. So much like we don't want to collapse the global economy by making planes stop taking off, we need attribution to get to key learnings. And actually, if you so, how many how many people here have read John Alspaugh's essay, Blameless Postmortems? Out of this group, I'd say maybe half of you remember you all self-selected to come here to talk about resilience engineering with John Alspaugh. Um, in his essay, he answers the question, "Why do we need attribution?" It's so that we can learn stuff from the people who were there, like what actions they took, what effects they observed, what expectations they had, what assumptions they made. And we want to understand their understanding of the timeline of events as they occurred. So this is straight from the horse's mouth. We need to ask who questions to be resilient. So here's where we are, some of us, and 
There's a, real many, there's a, a broad diversity of ways that postmodernism are practiced. Not everyone says who questions are, are taboo. We'll get to that a little bit later. But based on this assumption, this sort of model, if we want to fix the problem where we want to be able to get to learning, but we want to reduce the likelihood of destructive sanction, then we have an opportunity to do something about that arrow instead. So we want to break this causal link between attribution and sanction. And the way we do that is by understanding what that link is. And here's the thing, that link is called blame. Blame is the link between knowing who did a thing and punishing them for it. And what we actually need to do is not destroy that link, we need to rehabilitate it. What we actually need to do is get better at knowing when it is appropriate to sanction and when not, and at dealing with destructive sanctioning behavior. The question we need to answer is, how can we know who did stuff without punishing them? So, as all good talks must, I will begin with ontology. What is blame? I'm going to give you a definition that's pretty broad. It might not be the one you're familiar with. You might not even have an explicit definition of, of blame that you've arrived at. This definition is pretty standard in the way too many uh, moral psychology books that I've read. Uh, it's that blame is a moral judgment with a cognitive and a social nature. And I'm going to talk about both the, the cognitive and the social nature to so figure out what we can learn about blame that can help us in our incident reviews. Uh, the first question we need to look at is, why do people blame? So, uh, Jay mentioned Dan Dennett earlier, so I can say that Dennett points out that when we ask why questions, we're often asking one of two questions in disguise. We're often asking either a how come question or a what for question. We're either asking about causation or function. So how come we blame? Uh, let's, let's talk about how blaming arose in human brains. Why is the thing that brains do? Um, I'm going to take a pluralistic approach here that comes from this paper to argue that there is some evolutionary first draft of a moral mind. We, our brains are structured such that we can have moral thoughts. Uh, but this draft is edited continuously throughout our cultural development. Um, and in fact, moral cognition is not something that is innate. Uh, it's not just something that resides in our DNA. It's not inculcated, it's not something that's taught through parents telling their children to not do things as effectively as it's constructed. So, moral cognition is constructed by example, by living in society. It starts in early childhood development and proceeds throughout our lives. And the way we understand what is moral, what is good and bad, what is worthy of punishment or not, is by living in a society. So now we can ask the causation question. Now that we've dealt with causation a little bit, we can talk about function. What is blame for? So I uh, love Dr. Cook's archetype of bone. I love the way it lets us think about resilience, and he pointed out that resilience engineering on bone has been around for uh, about 3,500 years. I want to present to you an archetype of resilience engineering that has been around for as long as we have, which is that blame is about, moral judgment in general, is about social regulation. And blame serves an important and even necessary role in enforcing our norms. Uh, so the general way that this works is that we learn norms through this process of construction as we grow up, as we participate in our communities, and this allows us to make moral judgments. These moral judgments are the foundation on which we make specific moral decisions, and these moral decisions lead to some moral communication uh, with other people. This moral communication then has a regulating effect on the future behavior of the society. So, the interesting thing here, the thing that's going to be relevant later, is that when people over-sanction, when people punish people without warrant or the punishments are too severe, one of the ways that we regulate that norm-violating behavior is with the process of blame and sanction. So blame actually regulates blame. So let's talk more concretely about how we blame. I'm going to start cognitively. So how do we blame, what happens in our brains when we say that something is wrong and we want to sanction someone? So generally, let's start at the very broadest scope. Uh, there's a flux of stuff happening. And we perceive these as events. And as we perceive these as events, brain stuff happens. That's the technical term. And after this brain stuff happens, it leads to behavior. 
So notice that the stream of events and the behavior are both available to the public, but the brain stuff is, is private. Uh, if we try to tease out what are the pieces of this brain stuff, it starts to look something like this. We observe a negative event. We have some evaluative judgment that there's an event we don't like. We don't like it because it, there, there are various reasons why we might not like it. One of the more common ones is that it violates a social norm, it causes a harm, something like that. So the, the negative event leads to brain stuff. The brain stuff leads to warrant. Warrant is the justification that we are able to provide on demand for why we blame someone. Given a sufficient warrant, like a cop needs to knock down a door, supposedly, given a sufficient warrant, I can then be justified in imposing a sanction. And the, the warrant is um, graded. We will, depending on the thing we observe in our cognition, we will have finely tuned both warrants and sanctions to be appropriate to our understanding of what is what makes sense in our society. And one of the ways we do that is by thinking about whether someone else would blame us if we acted this way. Uh, one of the questions here is how the brain stuff works. And I'm mad that I'm the second person to have Hume slide because one of the original problems in moral philosophy is whether moral cognition, moral judgment is rational or based on our passions. So I'm going to talk about analytic models first. Uh, there's an article called The Theory of Blame, and it posits a model that is somewhat similar to this. This is a representation that aligns a bit that is about how we arrive at blaming judgments when uh, there is there's some omission. I should have done something, but I didn't. So this is just sort of a thin of commission's pathway of blame. And it starts with a negative event. And then we ask a series of questions about the event. We ask, was it a norm violation? If it was, we keep going. If it wasn't, we don't blame as much. We ask questions about causality. And we ask questions about the control that that agent had over the event. Then we ask questions about intentionality. We ask questions about what they desired, what they were able to foresee, and so on. And then we ask questions about what are the reasons that they had for doing what they did. Maybe they can get through all these other steps. I didn't intend for this to happen, but I have a justification. We take that into account. All of these combine to uh, what looks like a yes or no decision here, but is really a finely graded range of warrants and sanctions that we can apply. And sometimes we, it's not so much that we don't blame, it's more that we just decide that it's not worth sanctioning. So um, the, the main issue with this model is that it's completely wrong and brains don't work this way. Uh, one of the reasons that brains don't work this way is that the studies that try to demonstrate this model prime their subject by uh, asking them to think about their decisions, to think about their moral judgment. This primes them to take an analytic or deliberative mode to analyze the problem. Uh, the other problem is that we know from cognitive science and joint cognitive systems that it's very difficult to combine any sort of cognition to discrete boxes. Brains, uh, we've known this since the strong AI failure, brains don't work like information processing systems with gates and control flow. Uh, so we need to move on to an alternative. Uh, these alternatives uh, come from what are called intuitive models. The idea here is that blame uh, is often intuitive and automatic, and it's driven by some natural impulsive desires we have. You could, you could call it um, so natural, intuitive, automatic, or immediate, because these things happen very early on. Within milliseconds of our perception of the events, we can register brains doing this stuff. And one of the things that this implies is that these moral judgments, they're really sort of evaluations more than fully formed judgments, but these evaluations come up, they arise in our brain already formed. We go, you stepped on my toe, that's bad, but we don't have the ability to introspect and understand the reasons or the causes of that evaluation. It just appears in our brain and then we have to do stuff with it. And another uh, reason, uh, so another thing that makes this problematic is that we know that uh, preconceptions and, and heuristics and biases play a large role in how these evaluations are produced. So if I think that you are, uh, the, the technical term is socially unattractive, if I don't like you, I think, if I think you're a bad person, I am more likely to blame you and sanction you more strongly based on that bias. 
So what I, uh, what, what the field in general has been moving more towards in the last 20 years, and what I'd like to move more towards is, are more uh, holistic models. One of these models is called the parallel processes model, and it's the idea that yes, there are deliberative and there are intuitive judgments in morality, but they sort of um, interpenetrate. They're sort of happening together all the time. So one of the things that you do, uh, even if you're in a deliberative mode, is you need to recruit new information so that you can process it and make a decision. But your recruitment of that new information has to go through this intuitive automatic stage to get into your brain, so it already comes laden with these evaluative judgments. Um, and the, the, the key here is that if we combine intuition with deliberation, um, there's a good chance that this is really what happens in the brain. And so if we think about it as being a sort of a, a two system, a dual system model, we're getting closer. I'll describe why that's not close enough, but we're getting closer. Uh, and that um, our capabilities and our motivations have a strong effect on the moral judgments that we're able to construct. So what I mean by capabilities are, are what are sometimes called cognitive resources. So the cognitive resources that are available to us are in our environment, for example, how much time we have to process the decision, how much pressure we're under to make a decision, influence the quality of the moral judgments we're able to construct. Um, there is a, a model of blame that's called the prototype model that does away with some of the problems of the dual system model, but are actually really two completely separate uh, disjoint systems. They are really sort of interacting in interesting ways. It's called the prototypal blame model. And in order to explain this model, I have to explain prototypes to you, which makes me very uh, upset that Michael's talk, which is going to explain prototypes to you, happens later. So I, I have to get into a little bit of the the, the psychology, like, I understand that this is why people hate moral philosophers, but here we go. So, there has to, be, has to be at least one treachery of images slide at a, at a conference like this, and um, interpretations of treachery of images are sort of like opinions in that everyone has one. Uh, so Marie's interpretation was very specifically about, I can't fill this pipe, I can't smoke this pipe, it's not a pipe, it's a representation of a pipe. And, Ryan Kitchens had his interpretation, uh, it was, which was fine, it's okay, it's fine. My interpretation is a little bit different, which is, what even is a pipe? When we say that something is a pipe, what do we mean? This is a Google Images result for pipe, and if you look at these, you can see that some of them are pipes, and some of them are not pipes, and some of them are in a weird space in between pipe and not pipeness. And the idea here is that the first image that I gave you uh, Marguerite's pipe is a prototypal pipe. It's a collection of features. It's a canonical example that when you think of what is a member of the category of pipe, you compare things to. And in this configuration space, you decide how near that thing is to this prototype. And that makes, that, that's how you make a decision about what is a member of the category of pipe. Now, if I had showed you the first image on the left, and I said, this is the pipe, and then I had asked you, to make these categorizations, they would have been completely different. Um, and in fact, if you look at some of these, they're sort of less pipe-like because they're used to smoke marijuana. What you'll find is that the distance in the configuration space between the, the prototype and the, the example we're looking at makes it take longer for humans to recognize something as being a, mem a member of a prototype. And this is an intuitive thing that happens very quickly, but you can imagine. So, what is argued in that paper is that blame is prototypal, and it it argues for a specific prototype of blame, which is the care-harm prototype. I think uh, that there are some other prototypes of blame that we also use. But one of the things that's very important about prototypes is, can someone tell me what this is to shout it out? Panda. It's a panda. But it's not. It's a collection of weird, blotchy shapes. And you know that it's a panda, and you didn't have to think, does this collection of weird, blotchy shapes sufficiently match my prototypal concept of a panda? You just said, that's a panda because that's how prototypes work. And in fact, you can see the shape of the panda's face even though it's not really there because we want coherence. When we find something that's close to a prototype, we will put the rest of it there in our brains automatically to make sense of it. This is important for my typo and also for moral cognition. There's this idea that there's dyadic completion. So dyad here just means two things. I don't know why people call them dyad. So there's two things and there's some sort of completion. And the completion they propose here, based on the harm prototype, is that there's a victim and a villain. And when you see a victim, if you don't see a villain, you're
wide one. So we see this, for example, when people blame Obama for the hurricane, even though Obama wasn't president during the hurricane, and people blame gay people for hurricanes, even though I'm pretty sure that they're not actually related. People will find ways to complete this dyad and find a villain when they see a victim. I would like to argue that the failure human error dichotomy is similar. When we see failure, we are conditioned to find human error in a similar prototypal way. So that's something we can use to help figure out how to deal with human error, but there's some more things we should know about moral cognition that will help us figure out how to change how we behave and how we deal with blame. Uh, one of them that's very important to us is that moral cognition is not special. There's no special moral cognition organ in the side of the brain here that does the moral cognition. Moral cognition is just an instance of general modes of cognitive processing. Uh, and also, and we've been talking a lot about extended cognition here, moral cognition, just like other forms of cognition, is both embedded and embodied. So to describe what I mean by that, uh, you've already been introduced to Herbert Simon, who is a Nobel uh, Prize winning economist. Uh, he has a parable about an ant. And what he says is that as we watch an ant traverse around the jungle, let's say, and we watch it climb over a log, climb up and down the branches of a tree and so on, and we look at the, the geometry of its path, it looks quite complex to us. But uh, what Simon asked was, does this complexity in here in the ant, or is it a result of the ant's participation in the environment? So uh, Simon's solution to the problem was that the environment is external to the ant, and it can be discarded in an analysis of the ant's cognition. And I would like to humbly suggest that this Nobel laureate is exactly wrong here. Um, and I, I can say this with some authority because John Hogwood wrote an essay called Mind Embodied and Embedded where he said that this is exactly wrong. What we actually need to do to understand cognition is expand our concept of the mind to include not just brain stuff or body stuff, but brain and body and environment. And in fact, they're not separate things. They're just one big thing we have to understand. And this shows up in, in research uh, about moral cognition where people say that we should survey the landscape, they use very visceral ways to describe this. We should survey the landscape and acknowledge the complex terrain of social life and the idea that maybe inhabiting and having to move through this complex terrain in some way um, is influencing our behavior, the ways we form moral judgments. Uh, there's one more broad concept that I want to introduce here, which is this idea of cognitive continuity, which is this idea that our brain doesn't proceed to have discrete thoughts. Our mind is continuously moving through a sort of configuration state of mental spaces, or configuration space of mental states. And there are some mental states that are more attractive, there's sort of a gravity towards holding certain mental states. But our mind is just constantly and fluidly traversing this space. And so when we go back and we ask how does blame work, we actually have to expand the box a little bit and say that, okay, there's a stream of events, and then some stuff happens, we're kind of back at the brain stuff position, but we can be a little bit more accurate and we can call it uh, social cognition. And we can look at some of the ways we can categorize social cognition. So at the very bottom there's, I know that you're a person, I can recognize you as an agent, I can detect um, with very limited accuracy your intentionality when you use things. Um, I can use gaze following and faith processing to try to figure out if you're lying to me when you give me the reasons for what you did. And at the very top, we have things like trait inference, where we sort of figure out in general what kind of a person is this. Um, and so this idea that what we do when we engage in blame is we recruit a bunch of different social processes that have structure both in time and in the sort of uh, levels of cognition that we like to think of in our brain. So some of these are more immediate and early, and some of them are later. And the ones that are later, once uh, blaming, once an evaluation arises in our mind, can condition that evaluation and turn it into a fully formed blaming judgment. Um, so I, I haven't yet addressed one of the really problematic parts about blame and sanction and punishment is that it's often what is sometimes caused irrational, or called irrational. The punishment doesn't always fit the crime. This paper uh, talks about a particular form of irrational blame, which is not only this first order emotion and feeling that we have towards the blamer, but also a second order feeling of entitlement, a feeling that our feelings are, are justified and that we're self-righteous in punishing the offender. 
So this can lead to a number of incongruent behaviors. And to explain incongruence, I'm going to have to go on a little bit of uh, a tangent here. Um, incongruence is a concept that comes from Virginia Satir, who was a family therapist. And she uses a metaphor that I love and I'll share with you. Imagine uh, that there's this giant fountain. And as we uh, want the water in the fountain to get where it needs to go with, at the right time and the right pressure to achieve these effects, the fountain as a system is constructed of all of these pipes and valves and jets and nozzles. And what we want is for the water to flow freely through the fountain to get where it needs to go to have the effect we want it to have. And what, what happens when the fountain's pipes are corroded or the, the uh, nozzles or the valves don't open when they're supposed to or the jets don't work right is that pressure builds up in weird places and the thing the fountain's supposed to do it doesn't quite do. The water spurts in, in, in places it's not supposed to go. And this is what she thinks of as incongruence. Some, some of you may think of incongruence as being a sort of like the words don't match, the facial expression doesn't match the body language. She views this as a manifestation. This is incongruence, but it's this physical manifestation comes from a deeper place of incongruence where we're not behaving the way we think we want to, or we're not able to put our energy into the places where we want it to go. And blame often shows up uh, as an incongruent coping stance where we want to express ourselves but we can't do it congruently. We want to express hurt or anger or some other thing. And so what we choose, the, the options that we feel is available to us to express ourselves is blame. And so to the extent that blame is incongruent, one thing we can do is focus on incongruence and try to understand how to cope with it better. Uh, so incongruence comes from, in part, these societal rules that we have. Um, and societal rules are a combination of uh, personal and social and implicit and explicit. So we have these explicit socially communicated rules and we have these <coughs> implicit rules where you know you got it wrong where you do the thing and then they punish you but no one told you it was wrong. So much like the envelope of failure in the systems we work in, there's an envelope of failure in the, the social norms and rules where you have to transgress it to know that you've gone too far. Uh, there are also personal and explicit rules that we live by but there are also personal and implicit rules that are sort of submerged and difficult for us to uncover. She calls these um, survival rules. And we can't talk about who did what is a, an example of a survival rule. And the rule is there because it's adaptive, it protects us. If we're in an environment where asking who questions gets someone punished, we should stop doing it. But what we should ask instead is, how do we move to a place where we no longer need the survival rule? And if you want to examine the rules that you use that sort of govern your life and give you the possibility to do certain things, there's an experiment that you can conduct either um, with yourself or uh, with a group that you can facilitate where you ask these questions, you try to get some answers, you ask, what can you say about what you're seeing and hearing? To whom can you say it? How do you go about agreeing or disagreeing or disapproving? And then how, do you, how can you question or can you question when you don't understand? And what this all gets back to for me is, um, what do we do with the mad that we feel? Blame is often accompanied by anger, and anger sometimes erupts into these uh, destructive behaviors, but the anger itself simply is. It's just some, something that happens. And so the question is what we're going to do with it. And this is true for each of us personally in our own lives. It's also true for us as facilitators. When we see someone behaving in an incongruent way, what, we, what can we do? to help them. Um, and what we can do as facilitators can often be decisive. I would argue that blame is also like this. Blame originates by these immediate, automatic, effective, emotional, preconscious processes, and we can't prevent it. It just simply is. And so the question before each of us is, what are we going to do with it? So let's talk about what we can do about blame. Let's talk, and this is directed specifically to facilitators. And I want to say that the reason I had the slide about bosses is that we all live in a society where there are power relationships, not just boss and employee, but each of us have a unique relationship with everyone else, and part of that relationship is power. And so as facilitators, as managers, as participants, as peers, we need to navigate that relationship as we're doing these things. So I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about this.
Um, but one of the things we can do about blame is that we know that availability of cognitive resources helps us make better blame judgments. We know that the things that people were thinking, the state, the, the mental states that people were in, how they were feeling prior to making a blaming judgment, has a huge effect on the result of that blaming judgment. So we can try to construct environments that reduce um, the emergence of destructive blame and, and are already leading towards more productive outcomes. How many of you are familiar with uh, the Agile Prime Directive? How many of you, as facilitators, include some sort of preamble or stage setting? a scene or stage setting when you do facilitations. The reason this works is because it creates an environment in which we are less likely to assign blame to people because we have in our mind that people are doing their best. The other thing we can do is we can make, uh, we can give people more access to the cognitive resources they need to make better judgments. So don't rush them. Don't force them. Don't pressure them. Create a space in which they're free to pursue these slower and more deliberative processes so that those can actually happen. Because to the extent that we can recruit these more deliberative processes, we get better blaming judgments. Uh, the other thing I want to say for facilitators is that congruence is your superpower. First of all, being congruent yourself is necessary. You have to be congruent. You have to say what you mean and mean what you say. When you say something, as a facilitator, people have to trust that you mean what you say. Uh, you have to remain grounded and leveled in difficult inter interpersonal situations. And you can also identify incongruence in others as an opportunity for compassion and intervention. You can say, hey, I notice that you're a acting this way. Do you, maybe you feel angry. Is that something you want to talk about? We can interrogate these behaviors that we see, these blaming behaviors, these sanctions that people go, why did you do that? That why is really a, a way to launder blame. And if you, if you see someone as a facilitator, facilitator say, why did you do that? You can interrogate that. You can ask them, what, are you, what answer do you want? One way you can know if a why question is just a way to launder blame is you can ask them to restate the question with another word. If they can restate the question as a how question, or a who question, or a what question, or a when question, it, it's more likely to be a real question. If they have trouble with that, it's an idea that maybe they're not really congruently asking the question. Another thing we can do as facilitators, and you might be wondering why I brought up that path model of blame if it's so wrong, is that it's still effective for us to use as a cheat sheet in these interventions, and also in our own brains. If we can prompt people to recruit these deliberative processes, to ask questions about intention, or questions about causation, or questions about reason, or questions about was it really a moral act at all. You turn the server off. Does turning the server off make someone a bad person? We can recruit these deliberate processes that can cause people to reevaluate the initial effective judgment to come to something better. So we can also in intervene in general in incongruent blame behaviors by prompting people to recruit these more del deliberative cognitive processes. So we can see the uh, path model, and we can look at all of those as offerings. Those are all opportunities for us to blame less, to sanction less, to not over sanction. Another thing I want to mention for completeness here is that blaming judgments and sanctions are often finely tuned and highly adaptive. We go, we go about our days making these judgments constantly, and most of the time they're quite accurate. We don't blame people who walk by us and maybe nudge us in the shoulder. We don't see it that we need to stop and punch them in the face. We just don't do that. We're very good at not blaming people when it's not appropriate. What's, uh, what's exemplary and what draws attention to it is the times when it goes very badly wrong and the effects it can have. But we should acknowledge that blame itself is actually quite adaptive. And because blame enforces social norms, we can use blame to enforce blame and sanctions. And how do we do that? So here's the sort of model for it. So there's this sort of envelope of socially acceptable behavior, and someone transgresses it in some way. So we apply a sanction, and that sanction pushes it back behind the envelope of socially acceptable behavior. And the way we regulate social norms is that we just keep applying these sanctions. And not only do we regulate the norms as they exist, we also construct norms based on what we choose to sanction or not. We change the normative that we change the norms and rules of our society. So we all should also need to think about how we can use this horrible piece of social regulation to construct the norms that embody the society we want to live in. And we can use these sanctions to cope 
with the destructive land behaviors. And the way we can do that is we can find a sanction that fits in terms of how intensely we express it to the extent to which we direct it towards the person. So for example, let's go back to, we don't ask who questions here because we're blameless. This was a sanction. There was a social rule that said, you don't ask who questions. And I violated that social rule, and so I was sanctioned by the facilitator. And his sanction was almost prototypically a finding fault sanction. He said, it was in fact more so, it was a restatement of their rule. Uh, it was not, hey, you don't ask that question. It was, we don't ask that sort of question here. And actually, this is said to be very common. And he went on to say, you know, I know you're new to this team, and you might not have already known this. He was applying deliberative processes to say that I had justifications for why I did what I did. I didn't know that. And so as facilitators, we can find a range of interventions when they're necessary that we can use to gently and with compassion and empathy guide people towards expressing themselves that are in ways that are healthy for the society as a whole. So in conclusion, I want to say that attribution is a necessary source of resilience because it leads to learning. And in fact, we have these strategic resilience reserves, they're called human brains, and because we don't access them, because we don't ask food questions, we, are, we have all of these untapped strategic resilience reserves that we're going to need to start tapping into to solve the problems of tomorrow. I also want to say that blame, rather than being a problem, is actually a source of resilience because it provides social regulation. So what's beyond blameless is that we need to envision a new world in which who questions can be asked safely, in which blame and sanity are deployed with care and empathy, both for our community as a whole and for the people that we sanction. And we need to learn as participants and practitioners and facilitators how we can build this world together and discover these and other ways to support people who all have to operate within this world and learn how, learn how to behave. So I, I hope I've given you a glimpse of what this world could look like uh, through a glass darkly, perhaps, and maybe I've convinced you to give it a try and see what you can learn. Thank you.